So let's talk a little bit more about diseases that we see commonly. Uh, IPF uh, is the most commonly uh, seen form of interstitial lung disease, and it accounts for about 25 to 35 percent of all cases. Sarcoidosis and collagen vascular diseases are the next most common causes, and combined in clinical practice, these three diagnoses make up about 75 percent of cases uh, that we see in clinical practice. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about uh, IPF. So I'm going to take you through sort of an algorithm uh, or an approach uh, for how to arrive at the diagnosis of IPF, and uh, it's going to involve uh, not only talking to the patient, getting history, uh, physical exam, laboratory, ra uh, radiographic, uh, and also pulmonary function testing. So patients generally present uh, with a uh, varying severity and duration of respiratory symptoms. Uh, usually, uh, these uh, almost always include shortness of breath or dyspnea. Initially, uh, this is dyspnea on exertion, uh, but this uh, usually progresses uh, in severity uh, to involve less and less exertion, and eventually uh, they get short of breath at rest. Cough is also very common, uh, and it's usually uh, nonproductive. Uncommon symptoms uh, include chest pain, and these can be seen uh, in sarcoidosis and collagen vascular diseases, as well as drug-induced interstitial lung diseases, or related to a spontaneous pneumothorax as seen in pulmonary Langerhans cell, histiocytosis, or LAM. Wheezing uh, can be seen in hypersensitivity pneumonitis or chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Hemoptysis is uh, also an unusual symptom, and that's usually seen in the diffuse alveolar hemorrhage syndromes, and those are typically associated with uh, pulmonary vasculitides. Patients also can present with abnormal imaging studies. Uh, I see a lot of patients come to me uh, with abnormal chest x-rays or CT scans as the reason for consultation, uh, and usually those have been obtained uh, for the respiratory complaints we just talked about, shortness of breath and cough or they've been uh, incidentally found, they say the patient had a abdominal pain and got a CT scan of the abdomen, abnormalities were found on the chest, and they're sent to me. Um, so major ways people present shortness of breath and cough or with abnormal imaging studies. It's very useful to uh, compare imaging studies that the patients had over time. I've uh, had the opportunity a couple times to uh, have a patient uh, have serial x-rays about once a year for uh, uh, complaints that they continue to have, and you can just see the progression over time, uh, the slow progression of, uh, of, cha of interstitial changes. That's very useful, and that kind of helps uh, a lot to see, to look at old films. So I highly recommend looking at old films if they're available and really trying to find old films and track them down. Uh, I've been pretty successful at getting outside institutions uh, to send me uh, uh, the films, and uh, uh, so uh, I highly encourage you to do that. History. Um, so it's important to determine the clinical context in which you are seeing this patient uh, for interstitial lung disease. Age, uh, their sex, their medical history, the medications they're taking, their family history, as Dr. Lloyd will talk about, there is uh, genetic components to this, their smoking history, a very careful environmental history, including any pets that they have, particularly birds, a uh, history of bird ownership. Uh, there's actually been cases of hypersensitivity pneumonitis uh, in patients where the patient never had a bird and the bird was actually in, uh, owned by the previous owners of the house, uh, so that can be difficult to track down. A full lifelong occupational history and any hobbies that they have. Sometimes patients can have unusual hobbies that expose them to things that, that can cause interstitial lung disease. Um, I've actually used a comprehensive form developed by Dr. Lloyd and his team. Uh, it's about six pages long and has um, several hundred questions uh, over exposures to, at times, to try to get to the bottom of, of what, what may have caused this patient's interstitial lung disease. Are there any clues in the history? Is, does the patient have arthritis? Do they have a known collagen vascular disease? Is there a skin rash? Do they have rainouts phenomena or have they had recurrent pneumothorax? I recently had a patient. Uh, uh, that uh, had Raynaud's phenomena and some telangiectasias, uh, and we eventually diagnosed him with Crest syndrome. So um, uh, it, that, that can be very useful uh, in the history. Also important to consider is what the tempo of symptoms or radiographic findings have been. Most interstitial lung diseases, uh, with some exceptions that I'll show you in a minute, present with gradual onset, slowly progressive respiratory symptoms, usually over months to years. 
And again, if prior chest x-rays or CT scans are available, it's often very helpful to review these just to get an idea of how fast uh, these changes have, have progressed. And usually, with the benefit of retrospect, you can see things that on the very early x-rays that the radiologist may not have called. Uh, or if you were looking at these films blind, uh, you, you may not have called either. Uh, th these are the diseases with uh, rapidly progressive uh, uh, course, usually over days to weeks. Um, these are uncommon, but they do exist, and they include hypersensitivity pneumonitis, drug or inhalational exposures, the diffuse alveolar hemorrhage syndromes, uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, acute eosinophilic pneumonia, and uh, acute interstitial pneumonitis, or Ham and Rich syndrome. So if you see a rapidly progressive course, these are some of the things you may want to consider. Now let's talk a little bit about acute exacerbations, because this is a, a, a real issue. Um, these can usually be seen in IPF and other collagen vascular disease associated interstitial lung disease. Uh, sometimes the acute exacerbation uh, may be how the patient first comes to clinical attention. Uh, and this happens when the symptoms that, that they're having at baseline uh, are so insidious that really the patient's been ignoring them. The patient's been attributing them to, to age or other illness. Um, and then when this acute exacerbation occurs, a lot of times these patients say, wow, now, you know, I'm really having shortness of breath. This is different than what it was before. And they come to clinical attention. We're going to talk a little bit more about acute exacerbations later. What about physical examination? And this is just, you know, a lot of this is, is what we do uh, uh, on every patient. Uh, but obviously, vital signs are important, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation. I like to get oxygen saturations with the patient ambulating as well. Uh, that stresses the pulmonary system and sometimes shows you uh, desaturation that they have with exertion that they may not have at rest. What is their general appearance? Do they appear ill? Do they have any uh, general signs of, of collagen vascular disease or other issues? Uh, auscultation of the lungs, uh, listening to the lungs for crackles is very important. That can be a big clue. Cardiovascular exam, do they have a murmur that can uh, uh, give you a sign of a actual cardiovascular etiology? Uh, do they have S3 or S4? Do they have signs of pulmonary hypertension, which are associated uh, with interstitial lung diseases and collagen vascular diseases uh, in particular? What do their extremities look like? Do they have clubbing? Do they have rainouts phenomena? Uh, their joint exam show you any deformities, synovitis, any signs of inflammation? And what does their skin exam look like? Again, I've picked up uh, patients with sclerodactyly and telangiectasias and subsequently diagnose them with scleroderma or uh, crest syndrome. So that can be very helpful. Uh, these, this is actually from a, a book, a comprehensive book on uh, uh, interstitial lung disease that's written by uh, Schwartz uh, and uh, Talmadge King. And I've uh, actually, this is all the, the physical findings you can see in the various interstitial lung diseases. Obviously, there are a whole lot of them. But since this is a talk that's primarily focused on IPF, I've gone ahead and and uh, outline things you can see in IPF. Uh, and those include discoid lupus and Raynaud's phenomenon, although that's very common also in collagen vascular diseases. So um, these are some of the clues that should raise your suspicion uh, for IPF. An unexplained dry cough uh, and progressive dyspnea on exertion that's uh, been occurring for at least three months. Bi-basilar Velcro type dry crackles. Digital clubbing, although that happens between 25 and 50 percent of patients, uh, and desaturation, as I mentioned earlier, during oximetry testing. What about laboratory studies? These are some of the studies we do to search for etiology. Of course, basic labs such as a CBC chemistry panel and urinalysis are standard. Serological testing, uh, I tend to do these on probably more patients than I should, but occasionally I pick up a, 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 a unexpected finding. A hypersensitivity panel in the right patient as well. Uh, ANCA, or anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, and a B-type natriuretic peptide can also be done uh, in selected patients. Generally, there, for IPF at least, there's no laboratory findings that, that say, gosh, it's IPF. Um, but these are some of the findings that you can have uh, in the interstitial lung diseases with IP, the ones that are seen in IPF outlined in red, and I'll just let you look at that on your own because it's quite extensive.